morning and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Encompass Live. So I'm going to get things situated here. There we go. Good morning. Um, I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that are maybe of interest to libraries. Um, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always log in. Um, you can always go to our website and watch recordings. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where to see all of those recordings. Both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think that may be interested in any of the topics that we have. Um, they can sign up for upcoming shows or watch any of our archives. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, book reviews, interviews, uh, demos of software and products, mini training sessions sometimes, um, nothing too intense, we only for an hour long show, but you know, quickie type things. Um, really our only criteria is that it's something library related, something libraries are doing, something we think libraries could be doing, information we want to share with libraries out there, and this is all types of libraries. The Nebraska Library Commission is this Nebraska state agency for all libraries in the state that is public, academic, school, K-12 school, correctional, special, museum libraries, we're all across the board. So if you look at our topics and our archives, you will find everything you could possibly think of, I think, out there. Um, we do have um, some sessions that our Nebraska Library Commission staff that present. This would be, this would be things that are um, we are doing here at the Commission for Libraries. But we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have today. Um, from Nebraska still, but <laughs> not from the Library Commission. Uh, Crystal Booker here, she is our new, it's a new task force, yes. yes. Uh, the ADA coordinator for the state of Nebraska for this new ADA task force that we just, that has just started up. And um, she's gonna share with us today about how to provide access to um, people and basically everything you need to know about doing that in Nebraska. And the resources that you have available yeah. for everything. So I'm just going to hand it to you, Krista, and let you take it away. Okay. And what you guys get doing. You bet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. First of all, Krista, thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I want to acknowledge the Library Commission for inviting me here. Um, as Krista said, um, the ADA coordinator position, I've only been in that position here in the state of Nebraska since June. Um, about a year and a half ago, we shored up a statewide ADA task force. And I, my job is to lead the task force. And one of the many things that I do as the ADA coordinator is um, I provide training. And so we are going to go through a training this morning. Um, I just want to make sure everyone is clear. The ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is a federal law. So whether you're here in Nebraska or outside of Nebraska this morning, this what we're talking training. about, right, it should be um, hopefully good information for all of us across the United States um, as we are providing the best services possible to our, our um, customers. So um, just so you all know, I am not an attorney. What that means is that if you have specific legal questions about a specific situation at your library, I'm probably going to just recommend that you talk to either your legal counsel or someone there um, that you work with for that specific legal advice. But I do want you to feel free to ask questions. Krista's going to be monitoring that for me. And so please feel free to ask as we're going through um, the slideshow. So let's go ahead and just get to it. Um, basically, I always start my presentations off with the question of why do we care? Um, why do we care about the Americans with Disabilities Act and why does it matter to us? And just some interesting statistics for us as we kick off this morning to think about is that the um, United States Census Bureau is reporting that nearly one in five people are disabled. Um, and so that's an interesting statistic. And some of that has to do with um, obviously our aging population. Most of us are aware that our baby boomers are continuing to age. And so that leads to um, a various types of physical and mental impairments, which defines a person as disabled. And so because that population is aging, we do um, have a larger disabled population than say we would have maybe 20 years ago. And another thing to consider that not everyone realizes is that the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, was amended in 2008 and that became effective in 2009 and what that did is it expanded the definition of 
disability. I was wondering about that. Is there more things that we are now uh, acknowledging? Yes, yeah. yes. When the ADA was enacted in the 90s, they had a very narrow definition of disabled. And so what was happening is entities, employers, uh, people were focusing really um, hard on, oh, you're not disabled, therefore we don't mm -hmm. have to serve you, accommodate you, or make modifications for you. And Congress said, oh, wait, stop, that's not the intention of the ADA. And so that is when the ADA was amended by President Barack Obama at the time to make the term disabled to be more inclusive rather than exclusive. The other direction. Yeah, so when we're talking about the definition of disabled, we really need to kind of expand who we're talking about and who's going to fit into that term of disabled. Um, so again, as I was saying earlier, obviously with baby boomers aging, we have an aging population, we're seeing more people with hearing difficulties, vision difficulties. We're also seeing um, an increase in physical limitations. Here's an interesting statistic from 2015. Roughly 3.6 million Americans had difficulty walking or climbing stairs. That means they used a wheelchair, a cane, or crutches, or a walker. Mm -hmm. And I touch on that because I think sometimes those physical limitations are easy for us to understand. Mm -hmm. We can comprehend it. We yeah. can see it. We can even sometimes put ourselves in that position. And so then we understand that. But can you imagine 30 Point six million that's Americans yeah. are experiencing that um, in their lives. So again, um, the disabled population is very large. So why do we care? Because we truly are looking at a very large population that we are attempting to serve. So next slide here. There, there we go. go. So what is the Americans with Disabilities Act? I've already touched on it just a little bit. Uh, it is a federal law. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act is actually divided into sections, which are actually called titles. Um, and so as we go through this morning's training, we are going to be focusing mostly on what we call Title II. Title II is the part of the ADA that requires governmental entities to have an ADA coordinator like myself. It also requires governmental entities to serve all citizens. In other words, we need to make sure that all of our facilities, our programs, our services, our, our policies, activities, everything we do is accessible to all citizens. Um, so we're going to talk about the majority of that is going to be Title II. Um, just so you're aware, as we're going through this, if you are not a library, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. If you're not a library that is, say, um, a governmental entity, meaning a public library, you still could be required under the ADA to make sure that your programs, activities, your facilities are accessible to all people. So let's ask ourselves, Am I Title II, meaning a governmental entity, or am I Title III, meaning I'm public? Usually where you draw the line is, trace the money. Yeah. Where does the money come from? Um, for the most part, if you're a public library, the money is most likely coming from either a state, county, or city. So that's very clear. You're going to be covered under Title II because you're funding comes from a governmental entity, and you are serving the public through that governmental service. So most likely, the majority of the libraries are going to be falling under Title II. Something to think about, though, Title III, that's the section of the ADA that covers public entities. In other words, restaurants, movie theaters, museums. That's where Title III comes in. So if you're a library that is maybe funded by a nonprofit organization, or let's say, for example, you're a library within a children's museum, then that means you're gonna probably fall under Title III. If you are um, a library within a school, 
then you need to look at, again, where's the funding coming from? Are you a public school? If you're a public school, then you're going to probably fall under what we call the Rehabilitation Act. If you're a private school, you might fall under a different section of the ADA, or you might not fall under the ADA at all if you're funded by a church, because all religious entities are exempt from the ADA. So... What we're going to go through today, as I said before, we're going to be focusing mostly on Title II, but I want to be clear, Title II, Title III, the Rehabilitation Act, when you universities and colleges, yeah, universities right, and colleges would be yeah, under the Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation Act. School related as well. Right. So no matter what you fall under, chances are you're going to fall under the ADA or the Rehabilitation Act some way, somehow. somehow. And the majority other requirements for us as we are serving um, our consumers are going to be very, very similar. Um, so we're not going to spend a lot of time nitpicking these things apart. We're going to be talking about broad concepts that for the most part are going to be under Title II. But again, no matter what kind of uh, library you are, you're still going to have some sort of obligations to accommodate for the people that we serve. Okay. All right, so this is Title II. Again, Title II of the ADA covers our governmental entities. What I really want us to take away today is that under the ADA, our services, programs, and activities must be accessible to all citizens. And when you think about what is our role or what is our business as a library, and our role as a library is to provide services, programs, and activities. That's everything. Yeah. That's everything, right? So we really need mm -hmm. to look at all that we're providing um, to the folks that we serve and make sure that all aspects of what we do is accessible. Okay. And again, as I said, Title III is different. This is going to be our public entities, restaurants, mm -hmm. theaters, museums, daycare facilities, etc. And again, if you are at a school or a university, you're probably covered under the Rehabilitation Act. So that's the um, kind of compliance piece. So let's touch again. I want to just expand a little bit our conversation on who's disabled under the law. Um, and my little uh, picture there says not every disability is visible. Um, and as I shared earlier, with the definition of disabled being expanded, we have a lot of folks that fall in this disability category that we wouldn't normally think as being disabled. Um, the definition of disabled is basically any physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more life function. So that includes walking, talking, hearing, seeing. Um, those are some of the ones that we would um, think about, oh yeah, they meet the definition of disabled. But there's also um, a part of the definition that includes people that have a record of such impairment. Say maybe they have um, survived cancer. Mm -hmm. They're no longer seeking treatment. Maybe they're in complete remission, but they could potentially still be considered disabled under the law. Hmm. We also have another aspect of disabled, which is regarding as having an impairment. Um, this is someone who maybe has a facial scar due to a burn or something mm -hmm. to where they're not really limited in any of their major life activities, but they appear to be disabled because they have a scar on their face because of a, a burn. Um, so those folks are gonna fall under the term disabled under the ADA. Um, and then there's also several disabilities, which what we use the term invisible. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be our disabilities that you can't see. Um, our, we're seeing an increased amount of mental illness in this country. So folks that are suffering from any type of mental illness. Um, we also include folks that maybe are having um, reproductive issues. Those can be covered under the ADA immune system problems, mm -hmm. circulatory systems. Just think about what goes on in the inside of our body, whether it has to do with um, an organ or our brain, spinal cord system, digestive system. Those are all considered invisible disabilities, and those are gonna meet the definition as disabled. 
under the law. So see how that really opens up the and people that are going to be covered. And would this also be things like PTSD? Like yes. Mental yes. illnesses as well? Yes. Yeah. Anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. diabetes. I mean, everything that's, that is invisible um, yeah. is, is probably going to be determined to be disability under the law. That's nice that it's broad that way. There's it's so super many broad. Things that are like that that don't come up like in your day to day life. I mean, some I know I, I have colleagues that have like autoimmune issues, and sure. some days they're perfectly fine and you wouldn't even know. And then there's the one day where they are knocked on their butt and they're in bed for the day, and that's yes. just the yeah. way it is. Yeah. Yeah. And you that, wouldn't have known. Yeah. No, and you wouldn't have known. And that really is the intent of why they made the amendment to the ADA. At the end of 08, which became infected, became effective in 2009, was to truly become inclusive, yeah. meaning we want to include as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, all citizens need to be able to access all services, programs, mm -hmm. and activities. So, again, I just I find it fascinating. Of course, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just one of those things that I've done for several years. Um, has been involved with the ADA and. And this change in how we define disability has literally changed the way that we accommodate all people. It's actually um, groundbreaking in the way that we're treating our, our citizens. So let's talk about that. Now that we know who disabled or who might be qualified as a disabled person, basically what does that mean for us? And I'm gonna gear this towards our, our library um, audience today and that what does that mean well basically it means that according to the law um, we need to be able to make modifications or sometimes we use the word accommodations to our services programs and activities um, in order to make things possible for um, the disabled uh, consumer that we're trying to serve and what I want us to think about as we're going through the rest of this material is, is that we're looking at this on an individual basis. So I want everyone to just take a deep breath. What does that mean? That means that your facility, your program, your service, your activity does not need to be accessible to all right at the gate. You mm -hmm. cannot predict what somebody's individual need is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I do not want us spending hours in conference rooms together as we're planning a program or some sort of new activity to ensure that we are inclusive to all people. It is impossible. Oh, you'd be there forever. You'd be there forever. Yeah. You know, as we just spent some time talking about who's going to be considered disabled, wow, that's a huge list of possibilities of who's mm -hmm. going to be coming through your door um, to be served by you. And so don't get too worked up about, oh my goodness, it's got to be accessible for all people all the time, and we need to predict what people's needs are. That's impossible. But what you do need to be prepared for and what you need to be focused on is that your program services and activities need to be accessible for this person who's walking through the door or rolling through the door for this particular program and this service. And so as we talk about what a reasonable modification is, is it's just that we need to focus on the word reasonable. It doesn't mean that you have to build a new building. It doesn't mean you have to build a new parking lot. It doesn't mean that you have to um, be prepared to, you know, have all kinds of computer software just in case uh, someone who's blind or visually impaired shows up. But you do need to have a plan and you need to be ready. And you need to be training your staff with that readiness as well. Okay, so here's just a couple examples. Um, so for example, let's say someone comes in with a disability and they want to apply for a library card. Now most of you, I'm assuming, you can apply for a library card online. Um, you can come in in person. 
You have multiple ways. Well, do you know what you've done with those multiple ways of getting a library card? Is you've already accommodated people. You've already made a modification. Yeah, you've given them an option. In other words, you're not saying to somebody that you have to fill this out online. Um, that may not work for somebody, depending upon what their disability is, depending upon what their needs are. And so if you allow people to come in in person, maybe fill out a piece of paper and, and apply for a library card. Maybe you have your staff people at the front desk ready to fill out a piece of paper on behalf of someone because maybe they can't fill it out themselves for whatever, whatever reason. That is a prime example of what a reasonable modification is meaning your policy or your process of how to apply for a library card has already been modified mm -hmm. you know and some of us don't even realize what we did yeah. we're like oh we just thought it would be more convenient to have multiple ways but what you've just done is you are now making modifications so that way you're providing access to all people um, that would like a library card so that's just one example there's also a, another example um, when we're talking about maybe someone who is deaf or hard of hearing. Um, we think that automatically we think, oh, well, they are going to need a sign language interpreter, someone that knows ASL, American Sign Language. That's not always true. Depending upon the person and the way that they communicate best, actually an, an ASL interpreter may be the last thing they need. Um, maybe what they're going to need is some sort of um, what we call, we call it charts here in Nebraska. It would be like a, think about closed captioning on TV. You have um, services that are available that can literally type as people are talking, whether it's for a meeting, and you literally project the closed captioning up on a screen during your meeting or during your program or during your service. So that way, those that are deaf and hard of hearing can still experience and still um, understand what's going on, but it may not be a, a sign language interpreter that's the answer. And there's automated programs that do that. Yeah, actually, when we we don't have that here with our um, live show, but um, when our recordings go up on YouTube, YouTube has that feature, yes. which I know because I remember when we first started doing this. Encompass Live has been around. This is our tenth year of the show. It was a little iffy. <laughs> um, yeah. Some of the um, automated was not so, but I've watched a few of them lately. I keep an eye on them and check a spot check, and it's gotten a lot more accurate. Yes, I can actually like it actually makes sense. <laughs> yes, and you can just turn that on. And this is not something that we had to do ourselves mm -hmm. to like pay to have the service done mm -hmm. or have someone translate it, you know, mm -hmm. transpose it or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's just an automatic thing with a YouTube that you just click the button and poof, the it starts coming up right. on the screen. I love that that, that we have that available yeah and it's gotten so much better it yeah. has gotten better and then there's also um, apps available on smartphones mm -hmm. um, that folks with either you know they're either deaf or or hard of hearing that they already prefer and so this folk so they attend a session they can just use their phone and yeah so then you just maybe need to not get on people for having their cell phones out on the table during the meeting that app is, it's similar to, um, there was a computer program called Dragon Speak. People oh, yeah. still use yeah, it. We have that, yeah. Um, where it literally takes voice and mm -hmm. translate it into words. And some of the apps that are available on smartphones these days, they're excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, to your point, Krista, it, the technology is so, so advanced. So much, yeah. Yes, it is, it is um, amazing. Um, but so that's just, you know, a couple things to think about. And so then when we're thinking about the blind and visually impaired, maybe you don't necessarily need um, all your materials in Braille. What you need is send them ahead of time via email. You know, people are pre-registering for a program or an activity. Send it to them via email the day before. They can use a screen reader on their computer. Or be ready. Again, this is where you need to be training your staff. They can read for them. Um, and so it's just someone's blind and visually impaired. Again, we don't need to get all worked up or nervous thinking that we need to have everything in Braille. You need to be working with the uh, customer or the constituent or the citizen that is um, seeking your program service or activity and determine what's going to be the most reasonable modification that we can that we can make for this person in order to, yes, be compliant with the law but more importantly, 
including them in your program services or activities. And I think a lot of it might also just be instilling that attitude in your staff that figure out a way to make it work for this person, whatever it is that they need. It may be, it may be something you've set up ahead of time that you know um, you because we do have, we did do some grants here in the state where we did provide AD workstations as part of a grant to some libraries. Nice. Um, and that's great if you've got that set up and you know that that's there, make sure your staff know it's there and know how to get them started on it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that, figure out, you know, just know that there are these things available or at least have them. <clears throat> and hopefully, you know, as a library, that's what your point is, just to be <laughs> of service. Yes. Um, when they ask for something, say, let me try and figure out what we can do. Right. I'm not sure, but let me ask someone, let me see what we can do and just be um, open to whatever it is you need to tweak and you know, on the fly do to, to make it work. Right, right. And, you know, and I think that leads to my next point that I want to um, bring forward to you all. And, and if there's any attorneys out there listening in, <laughs> Um, you can plug your ears when I say this, but I, when I'm training people on the ADA, I always want to remind people to not react out of fear of a lawsuit. Um, that is the worst thing that you can do and do not train your staff to always act out of fear of a lawsuit. Um, especially dealing in state government, you know, we're a public entity. We will be sued. Um, we will. It's just, a very unfortunate part of, of our society today is that we are uh, very litigious these days and someone might file a complaint um, you know to the Department of Justice they might try to take you to court or whatever that should not be your motivation to be uh, making modifications or accommodating people um, you know as Krista said you need to be acting out of genuine um, desire to provide great service mm -hmm. to everyone that walks through your door and as long as you're doing that no matter what the end result is um, you're good yeah. you know what I mean because then you can just if you are sued for example all you have to do is say you know what my staff did this and this and this and we, we did our absolute mm -hmm. best um, to make a reasonable modification for this person and this is, was our end result. Um, are you always going to make everybody happy? No, um, that's not your job. Your job is to make a reasonable modification and do it to the best of your ability um, and, and just and not worry about the rest. Um, I really see people become paralyzed with fear of lawsuits. And that is definitely not the right motivation when we're talking about um, serving the folks that we are uh, supposed to be serving. So that's my little soapbox. And attorneys, you can unplug your ears. Um, I just think that we all need to be very uh, reasonable about this, that yes, you might get sued, but do not act in fear of a lawsuit. Okay? All right, so we're going to go ahead and go through. These are just some... Um, these next slides are just some helpful tips, um, mostly focusing on disability etiquette um, as a terminology that, that I like to use. And again, just some mental takeaways for you all um, as we're, we're looking at things. I do want to refer very quickly to um, the handouts here. Sure. Um, We've got one on the 12 basic able, requirements. Let's see if we can get our... This one? Yep. Yeah. This is a handout um, that's available to you all, 12 basic requirements for ADA compliance at the library. And we'll provide you with these documents in the archive afterwards too. I'll have them up on the website um, with the recording and the slides. That would be great because then this is gonna be one of your reference documents as you walk away today. I do not have time um, to go through um, all of the technical requirements of the ADA. So when we're talking about how wide uh, your path should be, what the ideal height of bookshelves should be, what is the height of your customer service desk or your reference desk. I, we don't have time to go through that all. That would honestly take days for us to go through. <laughs> but you got this. Yes, this is a true takeaway for you. Um, this is from the accessadvocates.com. It is legit. In other words, I have checked it out. Um, it is accurate, um, and I think this is a great resource because it is totally focused on libraries. 
And so if you don't remember anything today, uh, at least get this handout. And this is going to be one of your great technical takeaways as we leave today. Um, the other handout is another what I call legit handout. This is from the Office of Disability Employment Policy. Um, they're actually a division of the United States uh, Department of Labor. And even though this handout is geared more towards employment, I love the way that they have identified positive phrases and negative phrases when we are referring to somebody with a disability. Um, this relates to our fear conversation. I don't want anyone acting in fear um, when we're trying to serve the disabled population. If you can review some of these positive phrases here, I think sometimes too that gets us over our fear of offending somebody, our fear of hurting somebody's feelings, our fear of maybe categorizing or stereotyping somebody. These are great, again, legit, uh, positive phrases that you can use, whether you are trying to seek assistance, maybe within your board, within your, your staff, um, even just trying to report um, for your own documentation of, of what a person has requested or what type of impairment they may have. Um, so again, a takeaway for you um, to use as a resource and um, can we scroll down just a yeah. little bit, Krista? These tips, again, and we're going to go through some of these as we finish up the slides, but these are, again, more of a disability etiquette. Um, in other words, when to uh, help somebody who may be visually impaired, when to help somebody with a wheelchair. Um, and we'll go back to the slides because I think some of these slides have more of a visual reminder. Yeah, but this is nice that this is like a handout to give out to your staff too. Or something. Yes. Have, um, you know, study on it. Like there's just a couple, this is just a two page thing. And so I think of the other one as well. Yes, it's just so a couple it's pages yeah. long. And again, I, I chose these for a reason. Um, I always want people to have some sort of takeaway after they finish up a training with me. And again, these are two uh, totally legit uh, handouts for you. And as you said, Krista, you can use them for your own reference or as you're training your staff, your volunteers, uh, maybe even your board yeah. um, needs to be a little bit trained up. Uh, please feel free. Yeah, share these. Um, share those. Okay, so let's go ahead and just go through some of this. Again, these are just um, broad thoughts that I want us to all walk away with. So basically when we're talking about physical access, we're talking about keeping our walkways, ramps, keep them clear. Um, just because no one's used the wheelchair ramp in five years doesn't mean that someone's going to pull up and need, and need a wheelchair <laughs> ramp. Um, and you never know. And again, I just think that this is something that we just need to be cognizant of. Um, you know, I, you probably can't tell, but I use a wheelchair for my daily mobility. And it's, it's been funny over the years. Um, sometimes the only accessible restroom is maybe downstairs in the basement. We're talking about things in older buildings. Yeah. And so I go in to use the restroom and it, it also acts as a cleaning closet. Yeah. And so sometimes there's a mop bucket in the way, a big recycling, mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Think about the message that you've just sent to that person when you have obstacles that don't really need to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and no one's taken the time to keep that route clear or to keep that uh, restroom clear of things uh, that don't really belong there. So it's just something to, for us to think about. Um, again, when we're talking about reasonable modifications, um, I get lots of questions from folks that maybe your library is in an older build, building. Yes, we have that a lot. It's, lots. It's, it's hard to get funding to do new buildings or, or uh, modifications to buildings. It is. It's very difficult. And I just want you to think about, remember we talked about we're required to make reasonable modifications. And so if your front entrance to your library doesn't have a wheelchair ramp, for example, um, that doesn't mean that you can't allow people in through a side door mm -hmm. or a back door and just have a clear signage, you know, that accessible entrance is in the back, um, you know, and that's 
totally fine. That is totally fine. Um, again, as I said, restrooms. If the restrooms that are there, maybe off of one of your main um, stack areas, for example, is not accessible, it's okay to put a sign next to that um, and say accessible restrooms are found on the first floor or in the basement or whatever the case may be. And then again, you know, as you're making signs, uh, Braille is a good idea. Um, now with the internet, I mean, really on Amazon, Google, all you have to do is Google accessible signs and they'll be, you'll find all sorts of stuff and they'll already have the Braille on them. Um, so it just needs to be reasonable. Yeah, and part of this, I was thinking some, some libraries have, you're talking about taking a side door or a back door or something. Um, many libraries, you've got your public area and your staff area. We are, you know, no public allowed. It's the back rooms where you're cataloging and whatnot. You may have to, um, offer access to there. If you've got like a loading dock area or somewhere where you have things delivered and that's where, where the staff comes in the back door and that's the one that doesn't have stairs, you're going to have to say to your staff, if someone needs, it is okay to bring them around to the side, let them in that door, escort them through the staff area. If necessary. Okay. It's probably a good idea because I've been in many libraries. It's it's a it's a maze. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Bring them to where they can get out to the regular the rest of the library, yeah. and then when they're done, someone's going to have to be there to bring you. Make that a a a service. Yes. And just realize they're going to have to be passing yes. through there. Yes, and that is compliant with the ADA. And works, yeah. And that totally works. Um. So again, you know, I think just being cognizant of you know the people that you might be serving. And having your staff, your volunteers, have it already talked about, um, and just say, just do the best you can. These are our options, um, so that way we truly are um, being all inclusive as, as much as possible. Um, there, there is another possibility that I've talked about with several folks here in Nebraska. When we're talking about our buildings that are maybe over 100 years old, um, maybe even you're in a building that's on the historical register. Um, then you are not required to make a wheelchair ramp, for example. So then that leads to thinking creatively about home delivery. Yeah, yeah, um, a service. Yeah. yeah, and so add a service. Yeah. yeah, maybe add a service or expand your existing service, and maybe that means that for certain individuals that you've determined um, you can't accommodate or make modifications in any other way, shape, or form, you allow them to pick out books online, pick up the phone call, and maybe talk to a staff person to find a book for them, and then you end up either bringing it to them out on the curb, which is totally fine, um, or bring it to their home. And so again, that leads to what's gonna be reasonable for you and your staff, and what's gonna be reasonable for the person that you're trying to, to serve. That would be that would be our Carnegie libraries um, here in Nebraska yeah. and across the country. They were, Carnegie Library's gorgeous, gorgeous beautiful buildings, buildings, all the stairs going up yeah. into them, which was very, you know, regal and you know, <laughs> impressive looking, of course. Um, and they still are. And at the time, that was the part of the idea. But now, with all this, it, it doesn't work. And we know that's that's one of the big things. I'm sure. Well, many car two big big things with Carnegie Libraries. They're falling apart because they're old, and unfortunately, sometimes they get taken care of. Mm -hmm. And the ADA issue. Right. Everything's. Oh, it's a beautiful building, but. But, and they can make modifications sometimes, and some libraries have had to make the modification of moving into a totally new building because mm -hmm. it is so bad. Um, the library, the Carnegie Library building becomes something else, right? So that is an option. That's what we're talking about, those old yes. beautiful buildings that just were not, this was not something you thought about. Right. Back then. And so again, I just think just keep your, keep your minds open yeah. and be creative. Um, and just always do your best to to make modifications where you can. Okay, so oops, sorry. There Thank you. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about when people need help. Um, we need to make sure that we're asking. Um, you can see in this picture, um, we've got a woman who believes she's helping, um, literally grabbing someone who is either blind or visually impaired. I'm assuming blind because they have the glasses and the and the white cane. But that's the last thing you want to do is grab somebody. Um, I have a funny story, and I love telling stories, and we have a little bit of time, so I'm going to share it. Um, as I said, I do use a wheelchair for my daily mobility, 
and I had gone off to college and there was a ramp out in front of my dorm and it was quite long and it was big again it was an older building um, but it was it was fine it was it wasn't that much of a hardship but so anyway I'm I'm pushing myself up this ramp kind of slow you know but I was doing it <laughs> yeah and one of the guys on the football team big you know stereotypical football player came up behind me grabbed my wheelchair and gave me a push thinking he was helping. Mm -hmm. I had my fingers in the spokes of my oh. wheelchair as I was grabbing the wheels with a little bit of extra force to get up that ramp and had hurt my finger. And fortunately, I didn't swear or cuss, <laughs> but my heart just bled for this young man. He probably felt horrible. He felt terrible that he had ended up hurting me when he was trying to help. So again, if someone appears to be disabled and they appear to need assistance, ask. Um, some people will still turn you down and that's okay. And that's okay. Um, and so just make sure that you're asking because what happens is either people sometimes get hurt and then sometimes people are offended. Um, so just always ask, say, hey, do you need help with that door? You know, I'm here to help if you need anything. Um, and make sure that you're always, always asking. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to ask. I think they, if they're good, they'll say, nope, I'm fine. I'll I got it. it. Mm -hmm. And if they do, they'll, they'll say it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So that's just something to consider. Don't assume. Don't <laughs> assume. Don't assume. And then um, as we're talking about, you know, reaching out and touching someone or, or touching someone's wheelchair, obviously ask. Mm -hmm. The only time it is ever okay to ever carry a person who's extremely physically limited, either carrying them upstairs, downstairs, in or out of a, you know, a doorway or whatever, is in case of absolute emergency. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to get into a habit of every Thursday morning, we're going to meet Crystal out on the curb, and then we're going to carry her up the stairs to the library. Uh, not okay. Um, first of all, it's not safe. I would hate for anyone to increase their liability oh, here. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really not, when we're talking about reasonable modifications. Unless you're like a medical professional who does that and has been trained, I don't know that I would want any random person doing that right. for me. Right. Yeah. So just so we're clear, you know, as I said, be creative as we're trying to, to accommodate people. But what we also need to do is also be safe. And so the only time it's safe to actually pick somebody up say someone like me who uses a wheelchair for daily mobility is after you've asked them and two, it is an emergency and you need to evacuate uh, people out of the building. So that's just something to think about. So, okay, so next slide here, Krista. I'm sorry, I'm not paying attention to what you're doing. Okay, so here's something to think about when we're talking about folks that are, are hearing impaired. Um, I think sometimes, you know, I've caught myself doing it multiple times even this morning we look down we look down at our notes um, because we need to or we'll look down at a file or even as we're helping people look for books or whatever it may be in the stacks we look down rather than talking to the person um, if they're hearing impaired they may need to be reading lips um, in order to fully understand you uh, again you you just don't want to assume that everyone can hear you I think then too, it's just basic common courtesy to look at somebody mm -hmm. and give them some eye contact. I try. Um, yeah, and I know some people have um, anxiety issues or something with that. Sure, but it's just something it's good to practice. Anyway. It is. <laughs> yes, it's great to practice. And then I'm going to spin this to the opposite. Um, one thing that you know we do, I've I've caught myself doing this multiple times. If someone is um, visibly disabled or maybe even deaf um, and they're using someone uh, with sign language, we have the tendency to look at the interpreter, talk to the interpreter, um, not the person um, who's actually seeking the service. And so, you know, again, years ago, uh, with, with me using a wheelchair for my daily mobility, my wheelchair, I can't hide it. Um, but oftentimes people do not talk to me 
Um, I think this is my next slide, Chris, if you would. They don't talk to me. They talk to my husband. They talk to my sister, my, you know, whoever is with me, um, not realizing what they're really doing. for yourself. For yeah, sure. not realizing what they're really doing. So speak directly to the individual that's there for the services, whether they are visually um, disabled, you know, you can actually see their disability, or maybe they're hard of hearing and they're using someone um, who's, who's signing for them. Make sure you look at that individual and not the interpreter or their companion. Um, that is highly uh, rude <laughs> to do that. So again, it's just something to, to, to think about, okay? Um, also something to think about when we're talking about um, all, all sorts of disabilities is our media. So we need to ensure that all forms of media is accessible for the most part. Um, I think, Krista, you were talking about YouTube mm -hmm. earlier, that we can get closed captioning on those things rather easily. And for the most part, our websites, Facebook, Twitter, things of that nature are going to be accessible because they're, they're readable by screen readers. Yeah. But, but think about this, too, that maybe your reasonable modification is that when you're providing handouts like the ones that, like this, you know, with all of the small words, maybe what you need to do is you need to have a large print a large print version, of version it, sure. available. Um, and maybe you don't necessarily make it ahead of time and print a hundred of them, but maybe you have your staff and volunteers trained mm -hmm. on how to do that uh, on request. Um, or, you yeah. know, if you're super organized, do go ahead and get five or six of them printed ahead of time so they are in large print. But again, those are just the types of things that I want us to kind of keep in mind and, and, and think about as we're thinking what is going to be a reasonable modification for people as they're seeking our services. So the last slide that we're going to in this um, topic usually sparks a ton of questions. Service animals. Um, just broadly speaking, remember the service animal is trained. They are working. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I chose this picture of this miniature horse for a reason. Under Title II and Title III of the ADA, service animals are dogs or miniature horses. That's it. Really? Yes. I didn't know that miniature horses were specific. Yes. Uh, miniature okay. horses actually became um, a, an official, quote, service animal through some case law. Um, and they are serving similar functions as what we would consider a service dog. Um, so when we're talking about animals coming into our libraries, allowing a service animal to come in when maybe you don't normally allow pets. Right. Remember, service animals are not pets. Um, and that is a, a modification to your policy that you're making in order to accommodate people. So again, service animals are dogs or miniature horses. Now, where we get confused and where people have tons of questions is when we're talking about emotional support animals yeah. or companion animals. Um, some of you may have seen in the news, uh, was it two months ago, we had someone bring a peacock yes. into the airport and they wanted the peacock to fly with them um, as a companion animal. This is a slippery slope for many of us in that we don't fully understand what an emotional support animal or what a companion animal is. Um, we maybe don't have a lot of experience in this area, so then we get really nervous. Um, we also don't necessarily want a peacock in our library. <laughs> um, so then we act the way the airline did and said, nope. Um, and they've actually revamped their service animal policies on airplanes multiple times. Um, over the last two months. So here's something I want you all to consider. Again, service animals are required to be allowed in the library. Dogs, miniature horses. Other animals are most likely, not always, but most likely going to be emotional support or com com companion animals, and we do not have to allow them into our libraries. However, depending upon the individual, 
and what the animal was trained to do if you would be taken to court the judge potentially could determine that that specific cat is actually a service animal and needs to be allowed in the library this is where you are going to need case-by-case -case review you are going to be needing uh, advice from your attorneys you're going to be looking at past practice in other words what you've done before what your current policy says about service animals companion animals emotional support animals and other things of that nature also remember if you have someone that brings in a service animal or companion animal emotional support animal you can only ask what the animal's been trained to do and in what way that animal is assisting them you cannot ask the person what their impairment disability or condition is but you do not um, have the right to force someone to disclose that type of information but you can require that they explain the service that that animal is providing to them while they're in your library. So you do have that right. Um, and I think sometimes as we're training our staff and our volunteers, that is the, the best way to train our folks on how to handle this whole animal situation. Um, and then that way you're not getting too bogged down in, is it a service animal? Is it a companion animal? Is it an emotional support animal? Um, just train all staff when they're presented with an animal that they don't recognize that maybe never has been in your library before just very briefly say you know uh, we allow service animals in this library I need to know specifically what this animal's been trained to help you with mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes just gathering that information right away from the get-go uh, makes it so much easier to determine what to do next um, and obviously, again, you need to be working with your legal staff, um, your board, maybe you have a board of directors, whatever the case may be, yeah. to determine what's going to be best for you and your, your library. This in is this definitely situation. a, um, can be a difficult situation depending on, you know, and, it's, and I like that you said it's going to be, you got to do it case by case. Mm -hmm. You can't really have a blanket no. Yep. And because you're going to get in trouble. I mean, mm -hmm. if you do have someone who does need, the, I don't know, you said cat or um, bird or whatever it is that, you know, if they are, it's an anxiety issue and the animal's been trained to understand and realize when they're going to have that kind of a, um, a panic attack or something mm -hmm. and comfort them. I would want that animal with that person in my library to make sure it, it doesn't happen, that that person doesn't, right. you know, freak out and have an issue right in an incident yes. in your building but then um, on the reverse but, too if they're not legitimately trained that's the thing yeah they have to they, that's where out. this is the, <laughs> the, they have to be legitimate there you, know, you see all the stories of people just trying to fake it I yeah be the thing now is there any way I see here this is where she's wearing you know the in you know, assistance animal training right um, is there any requirement for people with service or um emotional companion mm -hmm. to have something on the animal or documentation with them that says here's the note from my doctor so right. to speak right or is that is that this is right is now recommended yeah, by, yeah this is um a gray area right now unfortunately because there is no requirement to have your service animal say certified um, in fact, you can buy service animal best paperwork for 25 bucks or so on the internet. Um, and then people are doing that. Unfortunately, they're ruining it for everyone that has a, a serious need. You can though, uh, depending upon where you live, and this is going to be a local law, but for example, here in Nebraska um, and here in Lincoln, we have a city ordinance that requires all animals to be registered mm -hmm. and so for licensed. Yeah. licensed. Yeah. So for example, if, if I had a service animal, um, I am still required to have my service animal license. 
Um, and this many, is just for pets too. This is this is something I learned. I moved here from New York. Oh, and we don't have that in New York. <laughs> and I had cats when I came here. I still have cats. Different cats now. It's been years. But um, and cats and dogs, those they have to be licensed every year. You have to renew right. and pay a fee right. to have your animal license. Right. Um, that they know you have these, and there's a limit to how many you can have yes. without bumping up to a different type of right. License, you know, license or whatever or breeder thing or whatever yeah um, so so you can still require still, that yeah. um and you know in some governmental entities for a service animal they might waive the fee so you're not paying yeah to have that animal registered or certified so again those are going to be more on a local level it's also going to be based on you know what your library policy is you know it's okay to require some sort of i'm going to call it a hoop um to have people Jump like through their licensed, um, prove they're vaccinated and yes. up to date on their shots so right. other people or animals don't get infected by something potentially. That's right, that's a common thing that I could yes. be totally appropriate to do. Yes, but ultimately, as far as asking them what service does this animal provide for you, you're just going to have to trust them when they explain it to you. And I, I would hope, unless someone's really good at it, when you pose that question. You're going to be able to tell oh they know exactly what they're talking about they're going to explain it boom 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 rather than someone getting a little antsy and right saying, well it's for my emotional support and you just get it once they start getting all right indignant then yeah if they can't specifically tell you what the sort of, animal's been trained for yeah. then you can tell something else to think about you are not required to allow any service animal to remain in your library if they become unruly if they are not potty trained Mm -hmm. If the individual that needs the service animal is not able to take them in and outside to go to the bathroom by themselves, um, in other words, your staff should never be responsible to take a service animal in and outside so it can go to the bathroom. Um, remember, barking once or twice is fine. Constant barking, growling, uh, yipping, snipping, mm -hmm. Uh, jumping, running around, all of that is not okay. Just like for a person. Just like a person who's <laughs> Anyone dis disrupting. Anyone disrupting, yeah. And yep. this is something good to have, and this is something we talk about a lot here when trying to get libraries, having a policy in writing that details this kind of thing. Sure. Um, so that if someone does say, well, it's my service animal and you can't kick me out no matter what, you can say, well, actually, yes, and here's our policy that states this, mm -hmm. that we have gone over with our lawyers or with the city or the mm -hmm. county. Mm -hmm. Your dog is is you know jumping at little kids. Right. I mean, you're no. Right. You're out. You're out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's right. Having you know think about those kind of things like you would about disruptive people. Exactly. Yeah. Same standard. Same thing. That's <laughs> right. So that's right. Um, I think you had another. Ah, yeah. Nice. These are just my sources that I use to put this together. Um, the United Spinal Association is where I got most of the pictures. And they actually have an expanded disability etiquette section in, in one of their um, documents. Great Plains ADA Center provided some information for this presentation um, on what uh, ADA titles, the Title II and III information that I shared with you. The U.S. Department of Justice is actually, um, they're the ones that people would file complaints with. If you, if they determine or believe that you're in violation of Title II and III of the ADA, they also provide some great technical guidance. So um, the handout that I gave you from um, ADA, um, can't remember the source right now off the top of my head, that's where that comes from. So the height of counters, all of that the is 12, in their technical. The tips ones, yeah, yeah, that's where the technical ADA um, provisions are found. Again, the Census Bureau, which I shared with you at the beginning of the presentation, and the Office of Disability Rights is one of the handouts that I gave you. So those are just sources in case you want to go out to their websites mm -hmm. and kind of um, expand your own research on the ADA. Do you have another slide here? Or is this one? That's it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we do have a question. If you have any questions, nobody had any questions during. That's fine. Great. Um, have anything else? We are a little after 11 o'clock, but that's okay. Um, we go as long as is necessary here to get all your questions answered and get through everything that Crystal was presenting, yeah. which we've done. So go ahead and type in your questions. And we do have one here that's just come in, um, which is interesting. This I can see how this can be some people's um, concerns or issues. How do you deal with those that use their disability as a crutch? And I'm doing the quotes because that's what they put on the, their question. 
for um, so they don't have to do what they need done, like making prints or getting on the computer. So I think this is an attitude of your staff that they're assuming the person is and is using it as a crush and saying, well, I can't make my own prints, so I want you to do everything for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's tricky same. one. And I think that's, I don't know. It's a Good. tricky one. Yeah. And this is what I, what, this is what I tell folks. Um, you are not a doctor. And I don't want you to play doctor. In other words, I don't want you to spend a lot of time determining that this person is not really disabled. Yeah, that's not your job. That's not your job. And that actually gets you and the library in more trouble when you assume that this person is not disabled. Again, 10 years ago, before they amended the definition of disability in the ADA, I would have given you different advice, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But remember that the, the definition of disability has been expanded so it is inclusive, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to approach this person as if their disability is legit, because again, you're not a doctor, but then two, this is where you need to be using some of your own judgment. Are they seeking reasonable modification of your policies? Mm -hmm. In other words, if they come into the library every day and spend four hours every day at your library and they are insisting that they need someone, one of your staff or volunteer, to physically maneuver around the library with them, to do all sorts of various tasks, you need to ask yourself, is that reasonable? Mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable commitment for me to make to this constituent or to this citizen to allow one of my staff or one of my volunteers to literally act as a companion for this person as I navigate the library on a daily basis? Some would probably argue that that's not a reasonable modification. If this individual needs that much assistance, mm -hmm. is it reasonable for them to, de to be relying on your staff for that? And or think, should they be bringing a companion with them? And sometimes you said that's gonna be, you're gonna have to use your librarian expertise in this because you have people that are not disabled who are, who do, they're needy. They're needy. Yeah, I was going to try and be nice. I was to try no. way. But yeah, they're just needy and they want help constantly. They need yes. you to do it. And you treat them in a certain way too. You'll decide, well, yes, so and so is just, you know, she has some mental disability. And yes, we're going to help her and sit with her at the computer and right. do this because obviously this is the only way to make it happen. But then you know, there's the ones that are just, you work for me because I pay your taxes and you're going to do everything for me just because I don't want to. And you, you make those judgment calls yes. and you can do the same thing with people who say that because of my disability, yes. I need to do that, this and the other thing. And it can be on a case by case basis and it can be on a day to day basis. Yes. If you're having a crazy busy day of summer reading and everyone is yeah. crazy busy and the person comes in and says, you, I mean, I think it is appropriate to say just to anyone. We are so busy. I don't have a person who can come and sit here with you right now and do this. Mm -hmm. This program will be over in an hour. Can you come back? That's reasonable modification yes. and accommodation. You don't have to be on call for them. That's what's about being on call to be their personal assistant mm -hmm. for the entire time if you can't. Right. Um, because a reasonable person yeah, is going to see that as say, a reasonable oh, I modification. Get yeah. I get it. I understand. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were doing summer reading this yeah. morning. I'll come back this yeah. afternoon or tomorrow or whatever. And so again, that's just where you really, again, don't focus on the disability. Don't focus mm -hmm. on categorizing or determining what people need for them. You need to focus on what's reasonable. And what you can do for them. Yeah. Right. And some of the things you're about getting on the computer, that's something that's a, a slippery slope just in libraries in general. I know you talk about the assistance of getting on workstations and things. There's only so much that we can do for anybody with helping them with things on their computer because if we are talking about personal information, yes. like, can you help me fill out this job application, which includes my social security number, my personal bank account, all this stuff, at that point you've got to say no. 
I can't do that. That's, I can't know your social security number. I can't know your, I, I mean, I appreciate that you need someone to help you, but you're going to have to find mm -hmm. someone who knows you, a family member or friend or someone else uh, to do this for you. Right. Because I can't be and you then there a your, line for there's, anybody. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the line you're looking at. You're looking at as a library, we are providing a computer station as a service. We are not providing job application or resume advice. That is not our job. You yeah, know, that's you know, not our yeah. service. Unless that is something you have with someone who's, you know, some a consultant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that here we're having a program about how to write a big resume. But I'm talking about sitting at the keyboard for them and typing in their mm -hmm. personal private info. That's, that's different. That you've got, and it has nothing to do with being disabled or not, even though that person may think it is. You've <laughs> got to reiterate, you know, yes. and explain. And yeah, just look at reasonable. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, it doesn't look like any other questions came in, but we do have a comment from one of our libraries here, Beth. Thank you, great updated info. Looking forward to handouts. We will use this for a staff training. That's awesome. That's great. Yes, so, please do use them for your staff trainings. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we are recording today, so this whole um, session is being recorded and will be available, hopefully just a little later this afternoon for you. Um, everyone who has attended here and who registered will get sent an email letting you know the recording is available, and you can use that in your staff training. Yeah. Play the session, parts of it, whatever you want to. Um, from that, all of our recordings are free and open for anyone to um, use out there. So, if nobody else has any questions while we're talking here, you had a chance to. I think we will wrap it up for this morning. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much, Chris, well, for coming over for having being me. with us this morning. Yes. Um, we had, luckily, even though we've had. Um, we had great weather. As you mentioned earlier, she, she walked in I from did. your office over here outside. It was nice today, um, in between some of our rainy and snowy days <laughs> that yeah. we've been having here. Yeah, um, so thank you very much for coming and sharing yeah. with us. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. As I said, this will be posted onto our website. And I'm going to switch over here. There we go. There we go. This is the Library Commission's webpage where you can find our Encompass Live shows on, on our website by searching here um, on our search. Or, luckily, so far, if you just do your Google, so far in the world, Encompass, we're the only thing called Encompass Live. That's <laughs> right. So, far. so when you search just for us, you find our page, you find our archives, you find our main page. So here's the commission's, our, our main page for the show, um, where you can find our upcoming sessions, but then right beneath them is our link to our archives. You can click here and you'll have all of our archives, our most recent ones at the top of the page. This is last week's. So um, today's show will be right at the top there when I get it posted. Um, we will have, let's see, we had last week, the recording, as I said, on our YouTube channel and the slides and the handouts. We'll have links here. We'll be all posted. We upload them to the website for you to have access to. This is our archives for all of our shows. And I mentioned briefly earlier, this is the 10th year of Encompass Live. So this is going back to the very beginning. And if you scroll all the way down, if anyone has uh, vertigo issues, close your eyes. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. There we go. All the way back to January 2009, we first started here. So do keep that in mind when going through our archives. We do have a search feature at the top of the screen here where you can search all of our archives. It'll search in the subjects, um, the descriptions, the, the names of different people who presented. Um, you will find old resources, other old recordings and archives here. Um, everything is dated though, so you know exactly when it, when it happened. Um, so be aware you will find outdated information, expired links potentially, maybe not link, information, uh, things that will look like they're out of date, and that's okay. It's there for archival purposes. We're librarians. We save and archive everything. That's, that's right. Our job. Yes. <laughs> so um, just pay attention when you are looking at some of our older sessions, um, what the dates are on there. So that's where the archive will be. And um, so later this afternoon, then hopefully I'll get it done early in the afternoon. Um, so that'll wrap it up for today. I hope you join us next week. Our topic is Building a Future, the Big Move. This is about um, library, the Tim Brooke Library and Campbell County Public Library System in Virginia, Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, they did a big move with their library, and their, um, their librarian there, Dana Bamba, is going to be with us next week to talk about how they pulled it off. 
and what happened. Um, this is a um, the business branch of the system. This is a smallish library, though. So um, if you're a small rural library, this would be something appropriate to you as well. So please do join us for next week's show or any of our other shows we have listed here. You see, I've got April and May um, starting to get booked. So keep an eye on here for new shows being added. Uh, and Compass Live is also on Facebook. If you're a big Facebook user, go over there and give us a like. We post when, here's your reminder about logging into today's show. Yeah. Um, when our archives are available, I post on here, reminders about things. Um, so please do, you know, if you're like using Facebook, like us there and you'll be notified about what we're doing. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning. Thank you everyone for attending. Thanks for Thank you. And we'll see you next week on End Compass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.